wrong. So I'm here, everybody. Happy to see you all. There's Mark and there's Sean and Barbara. Everybody's here. Um, I'm Judd. Hello. Kathleen, David. Hey, Venerable. Hello, everybody. Happy to see you, all of you, all of you. Happy to see you. Okay, darlings. So then, Adam, so what's the plan tonight? Is there a particular topic? Hello, Brenda. Is there a particular topic we want tonight, or shall I just do my usual raving on? What should we do, Anna? What should we do, Mary? What's the plan? No particular topic discussed, Venerable. However, if anyone has any ideas now, please. Yeah, I think if you have something, you're burning topic you'd like to ask, why don't you say it now? We can start on that foot and see where it takes us all. How about that? Does anyone have something? Perfect. What do you think? Nothing? No particular thing? Well, then maybe I'll start with something I've been thinking about, you know. Um, this, um, yeah. The big, the one from, okay, we just think we're going to be here for this little hour. Well, no, not, not an hour, but I'll make it an hour. So we can think about these things, so we can develop, use these tools, so we can develop our amazing potential. And I think that's the point. You know, I feel in our culture, it's very interesting. We know we've got potential. I think it's a very interesting point. We know we, we're very good at this in the modern world. We know we have potential. We get education. We become amazing things and we have great confidence in that. And if we're fortunate being born in countries like our countries, not being born in some totally poor place where you've got no access to no education or where you're, you know, or if you're in a female body, you can't get education in certain countries, how fortunate we are that we can have access to so much education. It's really true. But if you think about it very simply, and also, as I say, we know that you can begin like knowing nothing about carpentry, knowing nothing about music, knowing nothing about mathematics. But we know all the systems are there and there are examples in the world who've accomplished these things. So it gives us the confidence to know that we can do it, too. Now, we know it takes effort and we can lose our confidence sometimes, but it's very vivid for us. So we know from taking Rimache's saying we know in those areas we can mould our mind into the shape of a carpenter's mind, a musician's mind, a cook's mind, putting in those words. It's very meaningful. We know this and it's accessible to us. Yes, it's hard to have the confidence and we often can give up and believe we can't achieve it. But what we do not have systems for, this is very straightforward, and we do not have confidence in and don't even think this way, that we can mould our mind into a happy person. And I'm not being so silly, I'm not being hippy trippy, but this is literally the point. So if you take Buddhism and look at it in the most simple way, you know, when you hear about Buddhism, you hear about the very first teaching he gave, and it's the four noble truths. We hear these words, and it's all about suffering, getting rid of suffering. So then we think, well, I mean, maybe you don't feel like you're suffering too much. You think, well, that's kind of interesting, but who's suffering, you know? But if you listen to it this way, if you hear that really you just flip over four means of getting rid of suffering, I mean, if you conclude logically, well, what's the result of no suffering? It has to be the presence of happiness, doesn't it? These words are very simple, uncomplicated. So, okay, Buddha's view of the levels of suffering and Buddha's view of the levels of happiness, that's a dis different discussion. But even thinking in ordinary terms, it seems very encouraging. Wow, how to achieve, how to become a happy person. So then, of course, sometimes you can be a bit cynical and go, oh, happy, that sounds kind of boring, you know, who wants to be happy? It sounds a bit like Pollyanna, you know, but I mean, what it means is this is where we have to think, okay, well, what does Buddha mean by it? And I think it's almost too simple for us We because we make it so complicated. But what Buddha means very simply, right, an ordinary person, ordinary happiness means you'd be, you'd be fairly content means you wouldn't have too much attachment. You would, I mean, let's assume you've worked on it or whatever, but you would have not too much attachment, not too much dissatisfaction, not too much aversion, not too much depression, not too much jealousy, not too much anxiety, not too much arrogance, not too much low self-esteem. That's a half a dozen words. We know those words. And if all of us in this room can identify with one or the other as being our problem, you know, and then we know they can be debilitating. We know they can be overwhelming. Because rather than not knowing carpentry, not being happy means there's an emotional component as well. But somehow because it's the emotional component, it makes us feel almost like a joke to say there are methods to learn to be happy. It just seems almost too simple. 
and we don't happen to have that. We don't have courses. We don't have things where you learn over a series of years. You go, you don't enter a course of how to get happy, how to stop suffering. I mean, in the simplest way, in the most essential way, taking away all the trappings of Buddhism, all the pictures and all the mantras and all the stuff and all the holy stuff and all the nuns and all the monks and all of that, all the stuff that looks like religious, you take away all of that. And it's not joking to say, as Lama Yeshi beautifully puts it, we can learn to be, by being our own therapist, we can, as Lama Zopa puts it, mold our mind into any shape we like. And we're talking very simply here, forget about the shape of a Buddha, forget about the more advanced levels. We can learn to be less miserable. We can learn to be more content, more fulfilled. That's the simple point the Buddha's making. But when we hear it, we go, oh yeah, that'd be nice. But it doesn't seem too difficult, you know. So whereas with going to the gym and going to the carpentry course, you persevere. You can't even pick up an axe one day. You wouldn't even know what a, a handle is. You wouldn't know what a hammer was. But you learn it and you persevere. But somehow, because being happy deals with emotions and being suffering deals with emotions, and that's the part that makes it so hard for us, isn't it? To even have confidence that it's possible. Because we can't stand the painful emotions and we desperately want the good ones. So we're kind of like ridiculous, you know, it's too, it's too emotional for us. But we don't have confidence that it's possible. So then this is the Buddhist point. And so, of course, the part that's difficult, the words are unbelievably easy. The method for the Buddha of getting happy and stopping suffering, even relatively now, even this moment, even in a difficult situation, is by changing your mind. That's the job. This is the job. Now, Buddha didn't invent this. He hasn't invented the mind. He didn't invent these things. He's not a creator, but he's an expert at it. Put it that way. I think that's his expertise. You know? But you need perseverance and you have confidence. It's true. And it needs perseverance. And of course, it's a difficult job because, you know, if you think about it, and this is where it's pretty shocking, Remember, Lama Zopa said one time, and it's very shocking. It almost doesn't seem possible, but you think about it. He said the vast majority of humans on this planet actually have no idea that what goes on in their mind plays any role at all in their lives. Now, we know your mind plays a big role when it comes to being carpenter and musician because you have to train your mind we know that but not when it comes to being happy and not when it comes to being suffering so what does that mean it means that we put all our attention onto the outside world it's very simple we are convinced my happiness and suffering come from out there in fact we so equate happiness and suffering with the external events if you say to me Rubina, tell me about your suffering what's going on you know I will describe, in mean, poor old Adam, Adam's a naughty one again. I've got Adam again. I will describe the bad things that Adam did. I'll have in my memory pictures of Adam's bad actions. Think about this. It's really quite amazing, actually. If I you tell me about your happiness, Rabina, I will describe the delicious chocolate cake. I'll have in my memory the picture of that meal, that chocolate cake. I don't, we don't even know what it means to describe your happiness and suffering We because we so think it's the outside. This is a really profound point. Whereas the Buddha's literally saying happiness is a, is, is, is a name given to a state of your mind. It's, it's not to do with the cake. The cake is not in its nature happiness or suffering. It's the catalyst for it, not even the main cause. So part of our problem, no, our main problem for the Buddha is that we believe it's the main cause of getting happy. You get the cake, you get happy. You, you know, you get the punch, you get suffering, you get miserable. So we are, we are completely obsessed with the outside and we're geniuses at the outside, at changing the outside world. That we know how to do. So we, in, that, in that sense, Rinpoche means most people don't even know that what goes on in their mind plays a role in their happiness and suffering he didn't say it happens to somebody he said in their lives and it means like that because we're completely convinced it's the outside and this is i mean it's a very sobering point you know I mean, we know all the cliched terms happiness is in on the inside happiness is inside not out we know all those words and that's why buddha didn't make up this stuff he's just good at it that, that's all you know so it so the habits we've got this is the problem the habit of not playing piano is a pretty bad, a big, big habit to break, but you can break it. You can learn to play piano. And this is what's fascinating about the Buddha's view. The Buddha talks about ignorance. 
and it's a simple word, ignorance, but it's got a very specific function in Buddhism. And all the delusions, the main delusion of ego grasping, the one that clings to the self, the main de- then the main delusion of attachment and anger and jealousy and all of those, they've got an emotional component that's very painful, but, the, they've, got the, but they've also got this ignorant component. So it's like, excuse me, sniffing. It's like, I thought I'd give up allergies when I left Santa Fe, but I've got allergies in New York as well, so you can't win. <laughs> so anyways, the thing is, it's like um, bad, in, sort of it's like, it's like you say you don't know. I say to you, I say to Mary, what's one plus one? And Mary will just say, I don't know. Well, that's ordinary ignorance, and that's easy to fix. Why? It's because there's no mistake in her mind. But imagine if she believed that one plus one was three and was addicted to it and attached to it and convinced she was right, then that would be a really hard ignorance to fix. And that's the way Buddha's saying our ignorance works. And we living in layer. So it's bad enough that um, he's telling us it's bad enough. It's to think. No, he's saying the cake isn't the cause of happiness. He's saying the cake isn't the cause of happiness. It plays a role, but it's not the main cause of happiness. That's the fact for the Buddha. So not only do we not know the cake isn't the cause of happiness, this is the point, we believe the cake is the cause of happiness. If we merely didn't know the role of the cake, then we'd be easy to learn it. We discover, oh, it's not the real cause of happiness. But we, but in other words, Mary but doesn't just know the truth. She believes in a lie. So there's like double trouble ignorance. One, you've got the ordinary ignorance of not knowing, but you've got the really profound ignorance of knowing a lie. And that's how Buddha talks about all the delusions. And that's why they're hard to remove. He's telling us that for countless lifetimes, forget about the root delusion, okay, which is the basis of all of them. That's too subtle, but the the, the delusion of attachment that has the energy of dissatisfaction, that has the energy of expectation, of manipulation, of controlling, of possessing, of, but it's real one, the real, the essence of its problem is that it, it is a lie that because of such habit over countless lifetimes, Buddha says, it, it projects onto the cake or the boyfriend far more delicious qualities than they actually possess. And we believe not. We believe the cake is the cause of happiness and the attachment so old, it then makes the cake look divine. So there are layers and layers of lies in these emotional uh, states of mind. And that's the very specific, very unique quality of Buddhist psychology. I tell you, it's very fascinating. And I think we can prove it. It's not some kind of abstract idea. We know the energy of attachment, the, the, the neediness, I'm lonely, and then I fall in love with Adam and Adam. And so we know that all my neediness, all my kind of feeling of lacking is suddenly filled up with this divine person whom I think of all the time. And then, of course, he appears to my mind as totally divine, totally beautiful, the answer to all my problems. I have finally found happiness. And then, of course, all the undervoice of attachment, which we don't like to hear, which is very manipulative, that he had better make me happy it's his job to make me happy this massive expectation that he will make me happy we don't even hear this script it's because the emotion seems initially so delicious you know but it's layers and layers and layers quite literally of misconceptions so not only do we have not the true concept we have a misconception and we believe in it for so long that it everything even appears to us like that This is why it's so hard to change. This is why it's so hard to stop suffering and get happy. But when we understand the logic of it and the technicalities of it, which takes time if you have to study it to to do this and think it through logically, then we can have confidence and move along slowly. So this is Buddha's approach, you know. So we have to have confidence, begin to have confidence that it's possible that I can change my mind, that I can mold my mind into the mind of even a relatively content human being. But it just takes time. I mean, we know it takes time to mold the body into the into the body of a healthy person. It takes months and months, if not longer. So you, we learn to be patient and you've got good techniques, but we have to have that confidence with the mind. And the trouble is 
We don't because we might have confidence for a while and then suddenly Adam leaves me and I crash down to despair because the thwarted attachment is so much pain and suffering. You're overwhelmed by the opposite now, by aversion and jealousy and despair and I'm completely hopeless and I can't do it and I might as well kill myself. We know this. The extremes of our emotions are really intense. We know that. This is what makes it hard. But, you know, if we can see the logic of it, that means unpacking it all. And that means studying it properly because Buddhist, Buddhist psychology is very precise. You know, it's not just hippy trippy, cross your fingers. It's really very precise. And when we learn that, it gives us more confidence. And the key point, of course, that Buddha is making, and I always quote this, the word Buddha, you know, it's this the word, Sanskrit, the, 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 the etymology of that word is really delicious, you know. The first syllable, this is the end result of all the hard work. This is the long term. So that first syllable, bud, it implies the, the total eradication from one's mind of all the of ego, ego grasping, attachment, anger, pride, all the unhappy ones, the neurotic ones, the fearful ones. He has found from his own experiences, Buddha's unique point, and it's in, in shocking in the West, that those states of mind, anger, despair, jealousy, depression, anxiety, fear, they have no, they're not, they're not at the core of our being. They are not intrinsic to us. They're not, we're not, we're not set in stone. We can mold our mind into, the mind is infinitely flexible and it doesn't have any of these in its nature. That's how they talk. That's hard to hear because we think about it in our culture. I mean, when we think of an ordinary person, you know, well, forget this, that's a, sorry, the first syllable, d bud, the second syllable, even more outrageous, he has found, that tells you the etymology of that, that implies, da, that you can develop literally to perfection all the other states of mind, love, intelligence, compassion, kindness. I mean, that's an outrageous concept, you know. It's And it's shocking if we compare with all the assumptions we have in modern psychology and neuroscience. I mean, it's too absurd to say you can get rid of one part of your mind and develop another part to perfection. It sounds fanatic. It sounds absurd. Why? Because we give equal status, don't we? A normal person to all of these states of mind. A normal person has some anger, some depression, some anxiety, you know, some faults, yes, some, and then has some kindness and some love. And hopefully we hope the, we like the better ones. We don't like the other ones. We know that. But there's no view. And certainly not in neuroscience. I mean, that sounds like you've got to cut your brain out, you know, but Buddha's not talking about the brain. He's talking about your subjective cognitive process itself, you know. So it's a very shocking concept, and it really needs much thinking about to try and get some sense of logic of it. Otherwise, it just sounds too ridiculous. I mean, you know, when you first hear this, I remember one woman in a class, and it's understandable, she burst into laughter. What are you talking about, she said. What do you mean get rid of all anger, all attachment, all jealousy? You'd be unnatural. And that's our point. Because we, our view is that they are a normal part of a normal person. And what we, and they are normal parts of a normal person. Hear my point. But what we mean by that is that you you would be abnormal if you didn't have them. That's what we mean by normal. We mean you'd be weird if you didn't have them. And that's the thing that Buddha's not saying. You'd be an amazing being. And that's advanced. So forget that level of happiness. That's a final level. But it's good to hear it. And this is what underpins that view that we can radically, radically reconfigure our mind. We're not discussing the brain. We're discussing the subjective cognitive process itself. In fact, we're discussing conceptuality. And this is the thing that's also totally fascinating that is not initially easy to see. Because we are so, because these are so much, Im these states of mind, anger, love, compassion, the good ones and the bad ones, they are so, they've got this massive emotional component, which means when your body feels it. That's what we mean by emotion. Think about it. You say if a person never shows any emotion, it means they don't show their body is they're not they don't cry, they don't shout. So we think their mind is like cold, cold ice. So the body for us is massive. And as Lama Yeshi says, we make the body the boss. We even talk about we feel these emotions in our body, and it's true. But that's a, we think that's the most holy thing. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg of what's going on in our mind. And we are so not paying attention to our mind 
that we don't even notice what we're thinking until the body feels it. And this is just way too late. And this is the skill that Buddhist methods give us. The ability, this is the meditation techniques, to train the mind to look inside and to concentrate and get the ability to pay attention to what the hell is going on in your mind gradually before it hits the body. That's the real skill that Buddha gives us. And it's amazing and it's possible. But our tragedy is we don't notice until the body's shaking. We don't notice you're angry until the words vomit out your mouth. We don't notice you're depressed until you are inert in bed and can't move. Because we only pay attention when the body feels something. And we think the body's so special, you know. Why well, feel it in the body? Well, you start better start feeling it in your mind, which is way more subtle. And you will only get that ability when you make this paradigm shift in your life and start to pay attention to all your crazy thoughts. And in the beginning, they, it feels like chaos in there. We know that. It feels like total chaos. But you've got to start somewhere. The thoughts are not the, they're not the body. The thoughts are not the body. The emotions are not the body. They're mind. This is massively important, you know. So it takes time to train the mind to look inwards and then to look in intelligently, not just kind of a vague way. And that's why we have to get eventually there's some level of concentration in this brilliant technique that Buddha taught, you know, that's now so popular in the West. It gives us the ability to start to un to notice the thoughts because all this is the interesting point all the emotions like anger when we think of anger and love or as emotions that then when it's expressed physically isn't it and then it's a very powerful feeling it's true but those emotions are deep down you've got to drill down deep are underpinned by at a subtle level literally conceptual thoughts so love is a, it starts by being a conceptual thought and it's defined as, it's one of the virtuous thoughts, it's de, uh, emotions, it's defined as the, the wish that someone be happy. So how do you start loving someone? By saying the words, may you be happy. So you don't feel anything at the moment. Your heart is as cold as ice. So how you get it to become emotional, guess what? You practice it. You practice it. How do you start? You know, you say e equals m. You say one plus one is two, and you only know the theory. But when you get the experience of it, it becomes more real for you. You learn musical theory, and this is all theory. You play it on the piano, and now it becomes real for you. It becomes emotional. It's like that. So anger is what? Anger is a thought that is basically saying, how dare you do that to me? That is wrong. There's a whole layers and layers of implications there. What's attachment? Attachment is this thought that exaggerates the deliciousness of the chocolate cake. When I'm angry, I exaggerate the, the ugliness of the boyfriend. They've got this particular characteristic. And this is at the bare bones theory. You have to begin to hear those thoughts under the emotion, not just feel the anger, not just feel the love. That's way too gross, way too coarse. We've got to go down. And that's why you've got to have single point of concentration. Even some semblance of it, practice it, you know, because you have to learn to listen to what the hell is going on in this chaos in our head. So, of course, when we sit down to meditate, and even as Pavonka Rinpoche says in, the, in his Lam Rim texts, when you start to learn the nine stages of concentration meditation, you know, it takes several years up in the mountains to get to the subtler level. But the very a sign of success at the first of the nine stages is that you think your mind is getting worse. But as Pavonka Rimache says, no, it's not. You're just beginning to notice the crazy thoughts. You know? This is incredibly important to understand. So then as you start to learn more and listen more and catch your thoughts more, then you'll eventually grab them and change them before they come out the mouth. That's the goal, even relative goal in daily life. You'd be a pretty amazing person if you could learn to do that, I tell you. That's why in Buddhist practice, the junior school entry level grade one practice is not to look at your mind yet. We're talking high school here. It's to control the servants of the mind. And guess what they are? The speech and the body. That's why the first level of practice, it sounds boring to us, is control your behavior. It sounds boring, like what your grandma says, behave nicely. 
feels like a, a restriction, you know. But this is the most powerful level of practice. If we could all on this planet control our body and speech, the world would be a happy place. But look at us, uncontrolled, completely berserk behavior. It's it's not, it's really just so we take it for granted, but it's quite profound when we see it this way. And when you just look in your own relationships, why there's always a mess is because you don't go and, you don't go around killing each other, but you vomit out the words, you know, the drama, the suffering we cause when we can't control even our mouth. Forget the body, you know. So the very first level of practice, junior school, entry level, grade one, control your body and speech. Then that gives you the miracle of space to now begin to pay attention to the mind. This is being a Buddhist, people, I promise. So now you can ask me some questions or make some comments. Venerable Rabina? Yeah. Um, we talk a lot about the applying antidotes in Buddhism, like, yeah. for example, the antidote to anger, we apply patience. Mm. But I've not heard much said about the antidotes to traumas that we've experienced in our life. Mm, I know. And, I think and I'm wondering if you can, and I'm, yes. I, I'm thinking about the prisoners that I work with, and yes. I'm sure you experience the yes. same. Yes, exactly. Many of them, I would say most, have PTSD. That's right. How do we work with that? I know. So I, I, would like to, I would like to do a Buddhist analysis of PTSD, Adam. Would you like me to do that? Okay, it's taking this Buddhist view of the mind and how it functions and then doing an analysis as in my words. So you listen to it. And, the, and of course, the unique thing about the Buddha, you see, this is the button that's a major point. When we say PTSD, we mean a person who's had some terrible experiences in their life, right? Don't we mean that? We mean that, don't we? And then, and as a result of, I mean, putting it simply, as a result of being unable at that time or even since then to deal with it, to confront it, to see it and look at it for what it is and work through it, which is what a person would do with a therapist, because that's what we mean by that. So in other words, the main emphasis for us is on the bad thing happening and because we did not have at that time and maybe even now don't have access to understanding the mind, the different states of mind that we came with or had at that time that enabled us or not to deal with that suffering. So in other words, if I put this, you know, this experience, I always use the example, you might have heard me last week, I don't remember, but other people know it well, working with people in prison and always quoting one example of one woman, Sunny. I don't know if you've heard me talk about her. I don't know if I did it last week. She, she wrote a memoir ages ago. She was in, she was in the 90s and she was um, in prison in the 70s. She was hitching with a hippie husband, hippie kids in Florida in the 70s, got picked up by two guys. These guys got picked up at the police. They killed the police and they blamed the hippies. So she's on death row for 17 years or 12 years death row and then five years getting out. The husband was even executed. His brains burst into flames like nightmare after nightmare. So there she was, a totally innocent person. And this is in these are traumatic experiences. You're totally correct. The exact, so I'll do the analysis of exactly the analysis in a minute. So that she, but, for, but this is my point. For her, for some reason, she's not a Buddhist. She wasn't a Buddhist then. She's not a Buddhist now. I, all I can say is, and I'll do the Buddhist analysis of in a minute. She had this extraordinary emotional intelligence that enabled her on her own, in her cell, for years on end with a Bible. That's all she was given. She had this profound, extraordinary ability, as she put it, to, I knew I had the choice to basically not suffer. So she literally worked on her mind in the most intense way you can imagine. In other words, she didn't go crazy. She didn't live in denial. She didn't become depressed. She didn't become suicidal. She didn't go raging angry, like another example at the same time as I read about her, this other guy on death row, who would be what we call normal, Adam, who was innocent, who went out of his mind, raging daily, I did not rape and kill that woman. I did not rape and kill that woman. So these two extreme examples, Sunny, and I can only say for whatever reason, due to past merit, we can say it like that if we're Buddhist, she had this ability to confront it, to see it, and to know she didn't have to go crazy. She didn't have to have rage. And she worked, literally worked day by day. She had her own methods to learn to become a, a content, fulfilled, unangry person. As she said at one point, I realized I couldn't change anything. So I decided 
I am not a monk. I am, I'm not a prisoner. I'm a monk. I'm not in a cell. I'm in a cave. I mean, she's straight out of Lama Zopa's workbook, but she's not even a Buddhist, right? So for me, this is a powerful example for not being a religious person to, to show that how little we are capable. Most of us are not capable. Most of us don't have that incredible emotional intelligence. I mean, to be able to, in other words, she didn't come out of prison traumatized. She does not have PTSD. I promise you, Adam, she's out of prison now. She's a little old lady in a wheelchair. We're helping people out of prison. And when you meet her, you can see she, she doesn't go on about it. She's, in other words, she was equipped and managed without help to deal with the nightmares. In other words, what she did was work on her mind. She gave up attachment. She gave up anger. She gave up rage. She gave up aggression. She gave up depression. Speaking simply. So she did exactly what the Buddhist view would put is, which is to work on your mind. So who is capable of this? Very few of us, Adam. That's what we can, that's what we have to learn it. Are we communicating here? So in other words, she didn't suppress. She doesn't have trauma because she was able at each moment to see it, to confront it, to see and to work with her mind on it. And that's what we, what's that we don't do. So what do we do when you're hurt, you're hurt as a child and, and the world is a brutal place? You're harmed as a child, you're harmed as an adult, you see shocking things. And so you either go mad, you scream and shout and yell, or you or you get depressed and you live in denial. And so then, of course, because the Buddha's view is so fascinating, there's not one way about them. They talk about the mind. There's not a single thing, any sentient being that we see, hear, taste, touch, or smell that goes astray. This is a really powerful point. Everything is stored in memories. So, of course, you can't live in, you, you, they're going to come up somehow. That's exactly what PTSD is because we haven't learned to deal with them. We haven't had the tools. Do you understand my point? So our job is to help a person see that. I mean, if, if a person is brave enough with good person's help, like your help or a therapist's help, the, the only way to deal is to be able to go back and able to look at it and walk through it and unpack it. And of course, as, and this is the part about emptiness, when you can see the thing for what it is, the fear dissipates. But that's immensely hard if you've buried it all your life, you know. That's a Buddhist analysis, Adam. Do you understand? Yes, thank you. Very helpful, isn't it? It's really amazing because in our culture, we just assume there aren't techniques. I mean, Sunny's just weird for the world. Do you understand? And we all know there are examples like this. You always read about people in Auschwitz. The same, you get you get examples of people like this who somehow were equipped emotionally to not go crazy, to be able to remain with content, with fulfilled and content. And of course, the point is here, that's what Buddha teaches. That's Buddha's deal. That's his expertise, you know. And of course, it's the hardest job we'll ever do. Even if we've been training all our lives, it's hard when someone's mean to you and bad things happen. It's really hard to be able to see it and understand it. Because in our, in our culture, we don't have those techniques. We don't have the, the methods to see that you suffer. And this is the part that's really hard. Basically, we suffer because we have attachment. So in other words, with the, you know, the, the guy that went crazy, like it's typical, this is so, so shocking to us. It sounds like it's blaming us. The intensity of our attachment is so powerful because attachment basically at the deepest level is this junkie that only can handle things being nice, can only handle happy things. So when the terrible thing happens, of course, you become like that guy. You go mad. So his pride, his anger, this is not being rude. It's the Buddhist analysis of the states of mind that make us go crazy. But it's hard for us to hear it because it sounds like it's blaming us. It sounds like that because we have to have the external thing. And then in our own him, our own feeling is we have to sort of, I am this way because of what happened. And then we sort of, it's a feeling of getting off the hook. And if we can never begin with even, I mean, even the best therapists will do this. They'll finally get you to look inside. And if you can never look inside, you can never change it. So in the end, even all, our therapists, good therapists, will get you to go inside and own the part of you that, that's the source, you know. But that's pretty hard to get to. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's my way of saying it all, Adam. I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. What else, people? Anything else, people, dearest people. And everybody's got trauma. Everybody's got, I mean, since we're born, there are things that happen that we can't cope with. They're too much for us, too painful, too difficult, you know. Either anger comes or fear comes or jealousy or, or, or depression. And so we either put it away or we obsess about it, you know, and then it poisons us. This guy, like, he went mad, screaming daily. And if you'd said to him, well, you know, you can look at your mind and change it, he would have, you would, you could have been, you could have been sued for abusing him for being so cruel, you know. So we can see we don't have, we're even equipped. And this is, okay, this is my point. Don't wait 
don't wait till you're accused of murder and put on death row before you start doing what Sonny does. Do it when your husband slurps his tea. Wait for, do it with the simple things. And you, if you learn with the simple things to look at your attachment and your anger, and then the, the middle difficult things, and then when Adam finally leaves you, you won't be totally out of the blue. You will have, you will have dealt with your mini traumas, the mini traumas of day to day. I'm not kidding. I mean, his husband slurping your tea is what you have aversion to. Well, intense trauma is what you have aversion to. It's aversion. In other words, if you didn't have attachment and aversion, this is Buddhist logic, you wouldn't have suffering. This is the thing why the bodhisattvas don't suffer. They can, they can welcome and see the problems for what they are and even use them as grist for their mill. I mean, that's advanced, you know. So the Buddhist analysis is really clear. It's about the mind, attachment and aversion. They're the two main states of mind that we go between second by second that cause the source uh, are the root of the suffering of everyday human beings it's not the analysis we have in the western world i tell you because attachment can't stand problems attachment is a complete junkie that only can cope with nice things and you could say the stronger our need for nice things the more traumatized we are when the unnice things happen this is how it is, you know, and that's what aversion is. So aversion can become despair or depression if it's internalized, or it can become rage and anger if it's externalized, you know. But the fundamentals in Buddhist psychology, attachment and aversion. That's why Buddha calls them the three poisons, including the one of ego grasping. I mean, the analysis for us sounds too cute, you know. This is not the Western analysis at all, but this is the Buddha's analysis, and we need to look at it. Yes, Barbara, hello. Um. Yeah, kind of uh, piggybacking on the last question. Um, you know, I, I hear the stories that you tell about. Yes. Steve. Right. I've read, you know, some Hick yes. Frankel who says it's not what happens to you, it's your response to it. And all that kind of thing. Yeah. Intellectual, it makes intellectual sense to me. And the slurping of the tea, it's like, yes, I can practice that. But does this is this going to like fall into place in a flash for me or is no, this not a flash it's like learning to do it it's one step at a time hard work that's part of our problem in the in the west i think we we mystify spiritual practice i think it's some kind of hippy trippy mystical thing that'll happen overnight rubbish Many people have these outrageous spiritual experiences, they call them, where they suddenly see the light and see the universe, and, and then they think that's a spiritual experience. We're talking hard work day by day, Barbara, knowing our mind, seeing our annoy Annoyance is a polite word for anger, and most of us live at that level of anger. We don't get really angry. We don't get really depressed. We just get annoyed, frustrated, upset. We think that's normal, but annoyed, frustrated, upset is, is minor anger. It's a small annoyance because your attachment doesn't want a slurp. Your attachment doesn't want the red light. Your attachment doesn't want the ugly sound. Attachment is this junky in us to the levels of subtlety that we would not even see that is frantic to only have nice experiences. And when it doesn't get it, that's aversion. And that builds up, builds up, builds up. So the practicing of accepting simple problems first and pushing through and analyzing it and thinking of it as something different, that's the, you can't, you can't avoid it. You've got to start small. You can't just leap. I mean, Sunny somehow was equipped emotionally due to her past spiritual practice and past lives. God knows what she was able to do this in these years in this cell on her own and i mean on her own you know unbelievable nightmare even like her parents her children were given to her parents and she was happy they had family but the parents got killed in a car accident the children were given to the state the husband was even executed his brains burst into flames one nightmare after another you know you can't even imagine it but i just think she's a mind-boggling experience a mind-boggling example and of course in our culture we just think oh well she's just an she's an example she's an accident she's like unusual but it's just showing what we can do the real one is if she can do it i can do it but it takes time and it's not magic overnight and it's one step at a time and the fact is we don't want it we would just rather tell the husband to stop slurping it's easier do you understand because we'd rather just get what we want you know i think the way buddhism describes attachment to degrees of subtlety that would be quite shocking for us to hear it like that. We just think it's normal behavior, you know. It's quite subtle what Buddha's saying. It's very fascinating. So it's one step at a time, honey, and rejoicing in our progress. Rejoicing with every put up of every slurp, of every red light. And, and these are simple examples. They're just simple, but start small. Do you understand, Barbara? Yes, thank Good. you. Thank you. Hello, Keshava. You got a question, have you? Good. Talk to me. Yes. Hi. Um, I attended the Shuddha in 2018 um, and 
just long story short, I'm coming to realize perhaps with my therapist that I might have ADHD is why I've not been able to put in place some of the organizational habits that come with quote unquote a normal person. I'm trying very hard to be able to sort of deal with the repercussions of ADHD without medication until I get it a formal diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, how do I build those good habits, which are extremely difficult for me? Like I am, I can see clearly my aversion to so many things. I understand. How do I slowly and steadily without <laughs> giving up on myself at this time. I understand. Well, I, I'm not being sarcastic here and I'm not trying to diminish what you're experiencing, but I'm not joking when I say we're all bipolar, we're all schizophrenic, we're all up and down like yo-yos, we're all ADHD, we've all got trauma, right. we've all got people, and I'm not being sarcastic now. I all I'm saying is it's a question of degree. So you surely know even from the little bit that you heard at Tushita, what you're describing with ADHD or indeed is simply a fairly normal mind, but often a very, and you've got a very busy mind, but you've obviously got a very intelligent mind. So when you can hear that it's a super intelligent mind, you can, you know, it's got, you've got potential there and you can see, I can, by looking at you, I can see you've got good ethics. You're not a murderer. You don't go around stealing and lying and killing. You just got a very, very busy mind. So one approach to that is how about rejoicing? You have this marvelous potential and that of course you've got the ability to subdue it of course you've got the ability to work with it not suffocate it but by using it to do good things by using it to develop your potential you can channel this energy and that's a really good approach to have not to suffocate it and what as you just said normal people i don't know normal people sweetheart i'm not being sarcastic now and i'm not trying to diminish your experience because you've got some, you, I mean, some people can have ADHD and not be very intelligent and not have much capacity to change, but you clearly have. So you need some confidence in yourself and to see your own good qualities, to see your intelligence, to see your good ethics, to see the good parts of you that you can then utilize to help you move forward and channel this energy of yours and use it for the good of you and for the good of others. But you've got to find a method and it's totally possible. Do not have any doubt about it, but you've got to learn to live with it. It's sort of like when you're certain to play piano, mostly at the beginning, you, it's it's not called playing piano and it's very depressing. You can hardly see any evidence of good piano playing. It's the same here. But when you know you've got potential, you will persevere. So, you know, in what, so and out of interest anyway, tell me how it manifests in your daily life, this problem you say you, say you have. How does it manifest? Sweetheart. Just planning for future, for example, or what do you mean, do you mean by planning for the future, sweetheart? What getting things done, keeping things in place. Um, Give me a simple example in a day, sweetheart. Give a simple example in your day. For life. example, if I need to, um, part of my lifelong um, goal that uh, I have is to put out stuff on YouTube and put um, put myself out there. Just everything seems extremely big and I can't well, I seem think to already it Maybe that's too big, my lifelong. Can, can you keep it calm and a bit humble and a bit simple, darling? You've got these marvelous goals, but it's almost just setting yourself up for failure because, you know, you've got these 47 okay. different goals to be go win Wimbledon and do this and make a million dollars. Calm down a bit, sweetheart. What? Tell me a typical day. What do you do with your life? I'm not trying to be too personal. What's your life look like? What's your day? I mean, you, you live on the street. You live in a home. You live, have a bed. You have friends. You have family. You have a job. Tell me just roughly as an example out of interest for everybody. Right. Um, I live in Toronto. I recently started a new job as a server. Um, what I've been trying to do for the past couple of weeks is um, just build on my good habits in terms of um, trying to eat better, trying to... Uh, I've been okay, wait a minute. Stop, stop, stop. Keep it. Wait a minute. Stop, stop, stop. You've got too many demands for yourself. So you, you, so what do you do as a server? You have a, you have a schedule, right? Yes. So how many hours a day do you have to work as a server? uh eight to ten and how many days a week do you have to work as a server three to four and how four. and how long have you had this job now it's been a month and you got to work every day on time and you do your job and you go home yes well sweetie pie have you not noticed you've been doing it I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I'm not trying to diminish you. But are you not seeing that if for one damn month you have got up on time, you've gone to your job, and I bet you're a really nice server because you're a really nice human being and kind and you're polite to people and then you go home and then you go to bed and you get up next day and you go to work. Holy mother of God in heaven, what you are not noticing is you're doing exactly what you think you're not doing. Instead of thinking lifelong YouTube, this, that, stop doing all this ridiculous in the sky stuff. Be more humble. 
humble on the earth, please, and go one humble step at a time and rejoice totally that you've got a job and you're helping sentient beings and you're using your mind and you're on time for work. I, am I not speaking the truth? You are. Well, how about a little bit having these, stopping these bizarre, ridiculous life, you said it in one sentence, lifelong plans, putting myself there on YouTube, honey child, one thing at a time. And I mean that this is my advice to you. And I'm not just trying to diminish you. This is my advice to you. Please see what you are already accomplishing. If you were that serious, you wouldn't have bothered going to work. You would have put it off and not got up. But you are getting up and you are doing your job. So I'm not, I'm really serious when I say you've got to keep your goals humble and simple right now and then rejoice and delight that you are actually achieving those goals and that will grow to the next one and that will grow to the next one and then that will grow to the next one it's an evolutionary gradual humble process i can't stress this enough thank you are you hearing me darling yes so what, what you've got to do is hear all these voices, which is just your dissatisfaction, because you think who you are, this one of the cray, the worst pains of attachment is dissatisfaction. And you are a, a, an example, like all of us. I All you're doing is setting up these, you know, it's like, I haven't got a million dollars. I must kill myself. I haven't got myself out on YouTube. I mean, right. stop putting, it doesn't mean you don't have goals, but be reasonable, right. be reasonable and say, I'd like to put myself on YouTube, but sweetheart, don't then kill yourself because you're not on YouTube yet by having the goal, the thought, but then it will slowly, you'll, you'll grow it. You've got your job, you'll have money in the bank, you'll have stability, you've got friends, go one humble, I beg you, humble step at a time, which means don't just see your faults, you've got to see your good qualities and that lifts us. It lifts you so you can learn to do this. Have your big time goals, but don't then, then knock yourself over because you haven't achieved them yet. This is very distressing and unnecessary. Sweetheart, are we communicating? Yes. Will you promise you'll try this? I 100% promise. I'm so happy. Thank 100%. You. Thank you for your wonderful examples. Thank you. Thank you, darling. Because you've got to remember, you're not living on the street. You're not a junkie. You're not going crazy. You're not killing people. And this is what we never pay. We don't pay attention to this in our culture, but you've got good ethics. And if you've got good ethics, honey, not wanting to kill, steal, or lie or rape people, you have got potential. And it's our good ethics that's our saving grace. In our psychology, we don't talk this way, but it's an enormous point. If you were a junkie on the streets and you said you're ADHD and you were lying to people and stealing, then I'd say you have problems. Are you hearing me? So please, darling, be more reasonable and grounded in your own assessment of yourself and truly delight in your good qualities. That will lift you hugely. And that's the biggest one none of us do. We are addicted to our bad qualities. We, they loom large for us. And that's why we're so unrealistic, you know, darling. Please, please, please. What else, people? And this is advice for every one of us, I promise. We all can recognize exactly what he's saying. As my mother used to say to me, you're your own worst enemy, Bobsy. It's so true. We are. Come on, people. Talk to me. Questions, questions. I mean, that's enough for the day. I tell you, that's really so huge. The two things, Adam's point and this one, they're massive, you know. They're huge for us. We've all got to do what I'm saying to him. This is really what the, the practice is. You've got to have that confidence. Because if we did do, if we, if, if, you know, if, if Keshav wrote down a list of his good qualities, a list of his, um, of his, of the conditions he's got in his life, you would point to a very fortunate person, you know. And there, you know, and so it's like, we, we forget that. We never have that view. We don't have that view of ourselves. We always, the, the, the irony of ego is that the delusions and the problems loom very large. And then we, because we're, they think, we think they're set in stone and we identify them with every day, then we become overwhelmed. We have to really have clarity and intelligence and learn to look at ourselves. I mean, people, you know, I'm, I just praise Keshav in many ways, and I'm sure he knows they're true, but we often don't believe it, you know. We often don't believe the good things. It takes us a lot longer to believe and have confidence in our good qualities. And I'm not just trying to stroke his back and make him feel good. I mean, I'm not, you know, 
we've all got these good qualities. We've all got good fortune and good qualities. We just don't see them. And so it takes real, the irony is it takes courage to see them. Don't exaggerate them. Don't be arrogant. Don't be ridiculous. You don't live in la-la land, but be realistic. I swear to you. What else, darlings? It's eight o'clock in my time, six o'clock yours, but we, you know, I was late, so we're happy to keep going. Come on, any more questions, you people? And if not, we can happily stop. More than enough time, more than enough to cover today. What do you think, people? There's no questions in the chat, Venerable. Uh, so I think I think that's enough. I mean, I'm only I know I cheated you of 10 minutes, but I do talk much faster than anybody else. So you really got I always say that, but it's true. And they were very intense points, that the, the PTSD thing and the ADHD, and these are the labels we give in the West, and I'm not diminishing those labels, but there's always another way of seeing it, you know, another way of analysing it, another way of looking at it, I find it's very helpful. So, darling people, I think it's enough. I really do not think it was such a good, such good points, really such powerful points. Thank you for bringing them up, both of you. Amazing. Because we all identify, we all understand. We've all got some trauma, but we've all got, we've all got the potential to see it. And that's the one again. And this is really getting us to a more subtle level. I mean, when Dalai Lama was asked one time, how do you apply emptiness? This is more subtle for us in daily life. He said, he said, simply see things from another point of view. And that's literally all we're doing. All we're doing describing Keshab is seeing him through different lenses. You know, it doesn't say he hasn't got the problems he's got, but we're identifying it differently. And the same with trauma. You see it differently. I mean, look, I mean, look at Sunny. She, like I said, she's straight out of Lama Zopa's workbook. And she, I swear to you, Adam, she's not even interested in Buddhism. She knows I'm a Buddhist and she talks, doesn't talk about it much. She's got her own approach, her own style, you know, which is really incredible. And she must be so, I mean, she's so remarkable to me, able to see things differently, able to see things differently if we have the courage, you know. So for Keshav, it means to see his good qualities. See, put your good glasses on and you write them down and you say it to yourself and you have to convince yourself they're true. And then you have a balanced picture, Keshav. You have a balanced picture of yourself. You understand, darling? And tell yourself to shut up sometimes. Give it a break, Keshav. Back off. Shut up. YouTube channel one day. Come on. One step at a time. Do good at your job right now. Be a nice server. And I bet you're a good server. I bet people adore you, right? They love you, don't they, Keshav, at work. I know it. So remember that, God Almighty, forget YouTube. One day you'll grow that one. It'll come from what you're doing now. You're learning it now. So you keep going, darling. You'll be famous yeah. one day, but one step at a time, one humble step at a time. Yes, to the point which is so weird that even if the society that we live in considers serving to be not be life-changing, I've had a couple of people, especially over summer, come up and say it's that they've they felt inspired yes. that I could handle what I could handle. There you go, darling. There you go. Right. There. I could handle yes. all of that with grace and go. humility and with humor because I'm very humorous go. and I give like I'm sassy and I'm humorous. That's so right, darling. I know that. So you've got to hear this loud and clear yourself and really hear it and really go, this is pretty incredible. Because you know what some people are like who are horrible servers because they're angry and hurt and depressed and they can't help anybody. So you've got to take this for what it is and nourish your own heart with it, Keshav. Nourish your own heart with it. Nourish yourself with it. Okay? Yes. You have a responsibility. Yes. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. Much love. Jang chob sem chog rim poche ma kye pa nam kye gyo chig kye pa nyam pa me pa yang gong ne gong du fel va shok Thank you. Thank you, darlings. I'll try to be on time next week. But Anna, you text me or call me. Okay?